beautiful words. Oh, there we go. We've got it. In keeping with the theme of a wolf in sheep's clothing, which we did for the children's story, I was trying to think today, how can I tie a children's story in with the theme of my message today? So Little Red Riding Hood came to mind. And I had to use some, use some gymnastics with it to get the story out of it. The kids needed A wolf in sheep's clothing. We normally don't associate such a cute and cuddly kitten um, wearing a, a donkey's outfit with a wolf in sheep's clothing. We normally associate a wolf in sheep's clothing with a very sinister creature that is bent on harm, that puts on a facade of being a gentle and humble lamb, but underneath is a ferocious wolf. And so today, I'm continuing, and that's in keeping with our, our theme that we had a fortnight ago, if you remember, we talked about the masquerade that we are all facing uh, in the religious world. You know, our world is on the, earth, on the verge of great masquerade. And so in keeping with our theme about that, we are continuing our series on Worship Wars. This is Worship Wars 3. This is the final. Um, last, last time I had too much information to try and cram into, so I decided to divide it over two. So we looked at last, last time we looked at the sea beast, and today we're looking at the land beast of Revelation chapter 13. And you're thinking to yourself, oh man, do we have to stay in this book of Revelation all the time? Um, the book of Revelation gives us so much hope. I want you to imagine what the New Testament would look like if it finished with the book of Jude. It would be like a pregnant pause. So what's next? What's coming next? What's going to happen now? Because all of the, the first century New Testament writers expected that Jesus would come in their lifetime. And so if we got to the end of the book of Jude and Jesus hadn't come, the rest of the Christian world would be left hanging in anticipation. When's this going to happen? And almost mercifully, God has answered that for us by giving us the book of Revelation. Because God has given his people a message of hope and a message to carry them through the nearly two millennia that has gone by since Jesus was resurrected and went back to heaven. And so the book of Revelation is, is something that we should be excited about and we should want to get into because it's a message for all of us. And it begins with a promise. In Revelation chapter 1, it begins with a promise and a blessing for those who read and those who hear the words of it. And the Greek is to read aloud. So the blessing is upon those who read it aloud and those who hear it. So there must be a reason why these words are here. And we may look at it and think, you know, a lot of it's written in obscure language. How can it apply to me? But I'd like to suggest to you this morning that it does have a message. And it's a continuation of the message that we shared a fortnight ago. And so this week we are looking at Revelation 13, 11 to 18, the beast out of the earth. And when we think of a lamb that looks like a dragon, we're introduced to this cute and cuddly little creature, but somehow it speaks like a dragon. How does a lamb speak like a dragon? It looks like a lamb. Did you know the only other reference in the book of Revelation to a lamb is always to Jesus? So, remember we talked about counterfeits? This is a counterfeit, again, to the work of Jesus Christ. It looks like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. And perhaps in our minds, we would think of a dragon, a fire-breathing dragon. And if that was the case, we would expect a creature that looks innocent enough, but speaks with such authority and force. But I want to suggest to you... That this morning, that there is a possible other way of understanding this. And if you come with me to Revelation chapter 12, you will learn that the dragon is also referred to as the serpent. The serpent. So if you think of a lamb, take away the word dragon and put in the word serpent there, does that change its meaning and its understanding for you? Because we associate a serpent with what took place in the Garden of Eden, don't we? And there, the serpent used 
deception. Deception and cunning and lies. So, so think not of a dragon using force, but think of a serpent using deception. Perhaps I think that would be closer to what this beast is all about. We mentioned a fortnight ago that Revelation 13 has a parallel to the Holy Trinity. It is here that we meet the unholy trinity of the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast. And so this week we're looking at the differences between the Holy Spirit and the land beast because the land beast is a counterfeit to the Holy Spirit. Compare these verses with me. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would be another counsellor, the spirit of truth. But the land beast is another beast. And he is referred to also in Revelation as the false prophet. So on one hand, one speaks the truth, the other deals with deception. The role of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, was to bring glory to him. Not to himself, but to bring glory to Jesus. And the land beast, in Revelation chapter 13, is promoting the interests of the sea beast, as you read that story. The Holy Spirit, role of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction to mankind. But the land beast in chapter 13 deceives mankind. The Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in the book of Acts in the form of tongues of fire. The land beast calls down fire from heaven. This is a counterfeit to the work of the Holy Spirit. And we know that the Holy Spirit enabled the disciples to perform miracles, signs and wonders. And in chapter 13, we learn that the land beast also performs miraculous signs on behalf of the sea beast to counterfeit to the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. The land beast forces men to worship. One guides, the other forces. There's a big difference. The Holy Spirit was involved in the creation of mankind in God's image. Now you might think, where do you get that from? Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 7 tells us that we are made in God's image. And God says, let us, God plural, let us make man in our image. The Holy Spirit is involved in the creation of the image of God. The land beast orders an image to be made in honour of the sea beast. And just as the Holy Spirit was involved in the creation of the first man by breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, and it's the same word that is used for spirit and breath, the same Hebrew word, the land beast gives breath to the image that is made to the sea beast. So there are the parallels. And you cannot read this story in chapter 13, without seeing the similarities that comes with the story in Daniel chapter 3. And you remember in Daniel chapter 3, Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, faced what was a worldwide proclamation to worship an image. It was a state-enforced religious service. It had the backing of the king and the government and the army to enforce worship. And these three men stood tall and refused to bow down to an enforced worship. And of course, worshiping of idols was the last thing a faithful Hebrew boy would do. So in our day, if we were to say, what is the image to the beast? What is the image to the beast? What would it look like? I'd like to suggest to you that the image of the beast is the union of church and state. Okay, which, there's a little quote there from Ranko Stavonovic's commentary on Revelation. It says, The union of church and state which characterizes apostasy and ever precedes persecution 
is again to be made and is in fact the image to, to the beast and image to the beast. When we think about fire falling from heaven, uh, the other story that jumps to mind from the Old Testament is Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel. And here again, we have one man standing up against a state-sponsored religion. And on that occasion, the God who answered by fire, according to that contest, the God who answered by fire, he was Lord. All the people agreed to that, the terms of that contest. But when it comes to Revelation chapter 13, the God who answers by fire happens to be the unholy trinity. And this image is also in keeping with the topic that I shared with you on Armageddon a few months ago, Revelation chapter 16, with fire falling from heaven. Because at the end of time, it is the unholy trinity and the unholy, unholy spirit, if I can use that word, that is going to use the miraculous powers at its disposal in order to deceive the inhabitants of the earth. Seventh-day Adventists have traditionally seen in the United States of America a fulfilment to the land beast of Revelation chapter 13. That has been our historical interpretation of this text. Because the land beast arises after the deadly wound of the sea beast. The nation that comes up, or sorry, a power that comes to uh, world dominance after the fatal wound of the sea beast that we talked about a fortnight ago. And we identified the sea beast a fortnight ago as the Roman papacy, and we said that the land beast comes up after the deadly wound. And so we have found um, an application for that from a historical perspective in the United States of America. And we have traditionally held the point, the, the, the point of view that when the United States of America, through its government and through its uh, Protestant churches, in, creates an image to the beast, in other words, enforces Sunday worship, then the image to the beast will have been fulfilled. In more recent times, Adventist scholarship is perhaps less inclined to lean as favourably on that interpretation. They are more cautious about how the events of chapter 13, the second half of chapter 13, are going to unfold. Because in chapter 11, sorry, in verse 11 and 12, there is a shift from past tense to present tense in the Greek. And so the events that we are talking about are yet future to our day. And so our scholars are just saying a word of caution. We don't know exactly how this is going to play out. How it is that total world dominion, total world dominance by this land beast will take place. I just share that with you because sometimes things will not turn out the way we think it's going to be. We think we've got it all nicely packaged and we could be in for a surprise. So I mention that as a word of caution. But I'm comfortable with that traditional uh, application at this stage and I'm willing to back it um, before you. Notice that in Revelation chapter 13 and verses 16 and 17 that the land beast forces everyone to receive a mark upon their right hand and forehead. And this is probably the one issue in the whole of this chapter that catches everyone's attention and imagination the enforcement of the mark of the beast. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. And this is where it gets complex, trying to um, match up our understanding of this with our traditional understanding from a historical perspective. I'm not saying the historical perspective is wrong. I'm just saying this is where it gets a little bit challenging. Okay. So what does it mean to have a mark on the hand and forehead? And, and we could say, well, there may be some significant religious insignia that could be placed upon your forehead. And in more recent times, with the development of technology, 
the world has got really excited about this subject because it now, we now possess the technology to control people economically. Um, where's Josh? Yeah. Josh and I were studying about this recently and I pulled out my, my credit card with that little tap and go symbol on it and I said to Josh, the technology exists now to turn my card off. And the bank just has to go into their program and turn off my card and I can no longer tap and go. You can do it on your phone. Paywave. <laughs> I can turn my phone off too, Josh. And now we have such things as microchips. So it's possible to get something about the size of a grain of rice and put it under the soft part of the skin of your hand. And again, that act, acts in the same. It contains all the information that they need to know about you, about your bank accounts, your personal details, and about for you to be able to tap and go wherever you're out shopping. So the technology exists for something like this to, to capture people's imagination, to perhaps enforce what could be a worldwide economic boycott. But is that what the Bible is talking about? Because don't forget, the Bible was written in a pre-scientific and modern age. So what are the Bible writers talking about when they talk about a mark on the hand and on the forehead? I want to suggest to you that the mark of the beast is something far more, far more sinister than a barcode upon your forehead or a microchip in your hand. We talked about, a fortnight ago, we talked about the law of God was what was being attacked by the sea beast, didn't we? You remember that? And specifically, the first four commandments in the Decalogue. The first four commandments is what is being attacked. So, if I was to take you this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6 to 8, you would read these words. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. What is it that God wants on our hearts and on our minds? His law. Because His law is the foundation of His government. It is the very testament of His character. Isn't it? And if you were to go to Jerusalem today, to the Western Wailing Wall, you would see our Jewish brothers who take this literally. They tie those little phylactery boxes on their forehead when they go down there. I've seen them arrive. They, they get them out of their bag and they tie them on and they get those straps and they wrap them around their arms fr from their fingers all the way down and there's a little phylactery box on their arms. They take that literally, binding God's word upon their forehead and upon their arms. And when I see that, my heart aches for them because these are our spiritual ancestors, these people. They are the ones who preserve for us the very word of God. And you know what? They miss the very point of the new covenant that God wanted to give his people. Spoken by their own prophet, Jeremiah, one of their own number, who said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. You don't have to walk around with a copy of the Ten Commandments written on your forehead or bound around your wrist. God will write it on your heart and on your mind. Exodus chapter 13, verse 9. Speaking of their celebration of the Passover ceremony, uses these words. This observance, in other words, the observance of this festival will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. Where does God want to write his law today? On our hearts. On our hearts. So the mark of the beast then is a counterfeit to the law of God. The mark of the beast is a counterfeit to the law of God. And that counterfeit is perhaps best expressed in a counterfeit day of worship. And we, we talked about that subject a fortnight ago. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3 tells us 
that the seal of God, that the God's people, God's servants, are sealed just before the end of time, just before the winds of strife are unleashed on this world. And mercifully, there are angels that are holding back the winds of strife until the servants of God receive a seal on their forehead. So what is the seal of God? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 tells us that the seal of God is the Holy Spirit. The seal of God is the Holy Spirit. Now remember, the land beast is the counterfeit to the Holy Spirit. So if there is a, a genuine article, the seal of God, on your forehead, there must be a counterfeit article, a counterfeit Holy Spirit, that also wants to be on your forehead. Again, quoting from Mr. Jonovic's commentary, since the sealing signifies the working presence of the Holy Spirit in human hearts, the placing of the mark of the beast counterfeits the work of the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about a story we're going to be studying next week in our Sabbath school pamphlet. It's the parable of the ten virgins who are awaiting the bridegroom to come. And we've t- Jesus, this is the analogy Jesus is using of his second coming. His disciples had asked him, when will you be coming again? And he likened it to a bridegroom going away and coming back for his bride. And among the guests who were invited to that wedding were ten of the bride's best friends, BFs, besties. Five of those women were wise. They all had lamps. They all had lamps, but five of them were wise enough to take along more oil for their lamps. And Christian commentators throughout the, throughout the centuries have viewed the lamps as the word of God and the oil as the Holy Spirit. Five of those young maidens had the Holy Spirit in their lives and five did not. And what happened? What happened when the bridegroom finally came? There was a shout. He's here. Quick, trim your lamps. Get ready for the, the bridal procession, the bridal march. And the, bride, the, the bridesmaids, without oil, asked their friends to give them some of theirs. And what did, was their response to them? Matthew 25 and verse 9. Do you remember their response? Whoops. It says, Go and buy, go and find those who sell oil and buy your own. I want to challenge you this morning that at the end of time, there is only going to be two oils that are available. You will either have the Holy Spirit in your life or you will have the unholy spirit in your life. And only those with the mark of the beast are going to be able to buy the unholy oil. The symbolic receiving of the mark of the beast involves the acceptance of the beast's name and to be identified with someone's name is to partake of that person's character. Revelation 13 and verse 18 contains perhaps one of the most talked about, speculated upon, misunderstood verses in the whole of the Bible. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is a man's number. His number is 666. And perhaps no other number in all of history has captured the imagination of writers, of singers, rock musicians put this this thing all over the covers of their albums. This number somehow perpetuates evil, symbolises evil, whatever you want to call. And over over time, people have tried to apply this number to historic figures. They've tried to use, of all things, 
Roman numerology to make it add up to 666. And it can be done with a variety of historical figures' names. You can somehow fudge the, the Roman numerals, if you like, the numeric value of the Roman numerals to add up to someone's name. And, we, and theologians refer to this as isogesis. You're bringing something from outside of the text and you're trying to squeeze it into what the text is saying. True biblical study involves exegesis. What can I get out of the text? Not what can I impose upon it, but what can I get out of it? What does the number six stand for? And if I said to you that mankind was made in the image of God, what day of the week was mankind made? On the sixth day. And we've been dealing with an unholy trinity, dragon, beast, and false prophet, that are attempting to make man in their image. Hence, a triunion of six. Not man made in the image of God, but man made in the image of himself. Because when it comes down the end of time, it's all about worship and it's all about who we are worshipping. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Now, I said to you last time, you, you can't read. Whoops, you can't read thirteen. Thanks, God. You can't read thirteen without oh, <coughs> running into chapter fourteen, because there were no such things as chapters and verses when it was first written. The very next verse that follows on from the number of the beast is says these words. I don't know if I've flipped the batteries. You might have to take over manually, Rich. I might have dislodged something in here. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now we had just read in chapter 13 that no one could buy or sell unless they had the name of the beast on their forehead or his mark on their forehead. Contrast this with a group of people who have the name of Jesus written on their forehead. In other words, the Holy Spirit, who acts on behalf of Jesus, who speaks for Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in the minds and hearts of these people. Sorry, Jeffrey, you might have to do it again for me. And so at the end of time, it comes down to 7 verses 6. 7 verses 6. And of course the seal of God, the seal of God is perhaps ultimately exemplified in the Sabbath day because those who have made Jesus Lord of their lives will want the, the Saviour who is Lord of the Sabbath to be Lord of their minds and their hearts. And so the Sabbath just, if you like, is the one issue that at the end of time will show whose who's worship you are giving. In the days of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, the whole world, symbolically represented by the, the peoples of the provinces of the Persian king, sorry, Babylonian kingdom, the whole world bowed down to this graven image. And there was a death decree associated with this worship. You either bend or you burn. Do you get that? You either conform or it's curtains. And the boys, when they were brought before the highest ruling authority of the land, 
were challenged when Nebuchadnezzar said to them, What God will save you from my hand when this furnace is heated? Those three young men were thrown into that fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar jumped to his feet within a few moments and said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men in? And they said, yes, your majesty, we certainly did. He said, I can see a fourth. And the most, some of the most beautiful words that ever came out of that pagan king's mouth. And the fourth looks like the son of God. The son of God. Or a son of the gods, as he said. When you stand in the midst of a fiery furnace, this is, what the, this is what the message of Revelation is to you and I today. When you stand in the midst of the fiery furnace, when the whole world is bending and bowing down to the forces that want your worship, Jesus promises to stand with you. Jesus said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. My prayer for you this morning, no matter what happens in your life, in the future, in our world, you will never forget the one who promises to stand by your side. Though the heavens fall, though the rest of the world bow down, to a counterfeit day of worship, a counterfeit God of worship, a counterfeit Holy Spirit in their lives, and even a counterfeit law in their lives, even though the whole world, and perhaps, yes, there will be those who are economically forced to do so. My prayer is that you will know who it is that you serve and who it is who will stand by your side on that day. May God bless you.